Hi everyone, uh, my name is Moyur. I am a data engineer at Pfizer, um, and I understand that given my employer, I might have a unique perspective uh, compared to some of the other speakers here, um, but I'd like to peel back that curtain and give you all an insight onto how we are leveraging NextFlow in a distributed cloud infrastructure to analyze genetic data at scale. Uh, so quick summary of the presentation. I'll begin by discussing some of the modern challenges we face with genetics research. Uh, and then dive into an overview of our platform, and then discuss some of the challenges and opportunities that we encountered with cloud computing um, and using our ingestion pipeline as an example for um, those use cases. Um, so our team is situated in early stage drug discovery. Um, so believe it or not, uh, discovering drugs is a very long and expensive process. Um, and the golden question, number one, uh, question on everyone's mind is targets, targets, targets um, that can be exploited to generate these therapeutics. Um, and so a source of inspiration for these targets, uh, we could look back to Bio 101 and uh, look at some of the underlying biological principles uh, to identify some of these uh, targets. And so our research focuses on DNA variations um, that are derived from genome-wide association studies. Um, so I'd like to point out the two, I think, two main challenges with modern genetics research. Um, one is just the massive scale of data available, and also the reason why we're all here, uh, the challenge of reproducible research as well. Um, so this graphic is taken from the GWAS catalog, uh, which is the largest source of publicly available data of GWAS data. Um, currently, there's around 40,000 or so studies. Um, as we can see, in recent times, there's just a sharp increase in the number of studies that have been made publicly available, um, which introduces, you know, a very big data problem. And additionally, I don't need to belabor this point too much to this audience, uh, reproducible research is very challenging. And within a pharmaceutical uh, organization, you have varying different skill levels um, technical expertise, and also just preferences for languages and pipelines. Um, and as was shown in the seminal NextFlow paper, um, there can even be inconsistencies in algorithms across multiple platforms. Um, so this really uh, provides a need for a standardized set of pipeline definitions in order to run these workflows. Um, so from here, I'd like to introduce the genetic informatics platform. Um, so this is a resource we've developed that really enables reproducible workflows uh, through a distributed cloud infrastructure and provides an internalized genetics data repository. Uh, so to give an overview of the GIP, I would say there's four main components. Um, one is a set of visualization tools to aid in hypothesis generalization and target identification. Um, we also have a service that serves individual linkage disequilibrium data, so essentially to see the uneven inheritance patterns between alleles. And then additionally, we have that centralized data repository in addition to individual pipeline outputs um, from user-defined workflows. And then finally, we leverage NextFlow in a AWS batch system uh, to run these processes on the cloud. Uh, so just to give an overview of how we're specifically using NextFlow in our setup, um, so there's two main implementations. Um, one, we have a set of standardized pipelines that we have developed internally um, and made available to our users. And so we have multiple modalities in which these pipelines can be accessed. Um, so we have a user interface for those folks who are, um, just want a point and click solution and um, can access those resources through there. And additionally, we have a command line interface to provide a wrapper for all these functionalities, and then also an API to do more programmatic access for these um, workflows. And so additionally, we also enable users to implement their own workflows. Um, so the two main components for that is as long as they have a Docker container and their NextFlow definition along with a configuration file, um, you're able to then leverage our cloud infrastructure um, and as discussed earlier today, we use AWS Batch as our executor of choice, and that allows us to get the nice reproducibility features that NextFlow provides. Um, and from here, I think this really presents one of the biggest, uh, in my opinion, opportunities of cloud computing, um, is that it enables dynamic vertical and horizontal scaling. 
Um, so I know we've all been in that situation on the HPC uh, where you go to submit your job and you see that there's 10,000 jobs ahead of you in the, cluster, in the queue um, and you're left waiting hours, if not days, to run your analysis. Um, so with the cloud, I like to think that we have access to an unlimited amount of resources. Um, and so this allows you to tailor your workflow um, and get those resources on demand while also being efficient um, because cost is important for this type of uh, cloud infrastructure um, where you can scale it down uh, to as, as little resources as you need. And additionally, um, sometimes the workflows that you're running uh, just are, exceed the hardware limitations within your HPC. Um, and so, you know, having this resource really now allows you to expand beyond um, what you might be limited to on, with an on-prem resource. Um, and so for the next part of the presentation, I'll dive into our internalized uh, genetics data repository. Uh, so we're calling it the GWAS DB. So this really is a process that is driven by NextFlow to ingest this uh, large amount of data um, into our columnar database, uh, which is run on the AWS Redshift platform. Um, so what are the data sources for this resource? Um, so we have internalized the GWAS catalog. Um, so we have almost all of the 40,000 studies internalized into a standardized database, um, which can be queried by our users through a variety of different modalities. And then also any internal studies that are available to us are integrated into the system as well. Um, so one of the limitations mentioned from the GWAS catalog themselves is that they're unable to perform uh, this cross-study analysis, right? Um, so what we've been able to achieve is um, cross-study analysis, and, and one of the ways that we're able to do this is through the standardized database, and these are two screenshots from the user interface. Um, so the graphic on the left is a locus zoom plot. Uh, so essentially what this does is you take a phenotype of interest and it returns all of the variants that are associated with a specific gene or locus of interest. Um, and it's fairly performant. Um, so you can query hundreds or thousands of, or thousands of studies in a matter of seconds. Um, so you can mouse over individual variants and see the associations across different studies that map to that phenotype. And from there, you can select one variant and generate additional visualizations such as FIWAS. And in this instance, I've shown a FIWAS forest plot where it shows associations of that variant with other phenotypes. Um, so within the drug discovery context, this is really important uh, because let's say you're targeting a variant that affects kidney function, you don't also want it to increase blood pressure or be associated with a adverse phenotype um, which could lead to unintended side effects. Uh, so, I've shown you what the GOSDB is, and now the question is, how did we internalize this data? Um, and this really is a process that's uh, NextFlow pipeline um, that's really leveraging the cloud infrastructure that we've built. Um, so the first step is a harmonization step. Um, so essentially, this is the process where we take those GWAS inputs and standardize it to a set of com common column types. Um, so this is one challenge, not specific to the cloud, um, but one that is that, that does require a manual mapping of these column names to those um, common types. And then additionally, in this process, we also flip alleles in, in, the, in the instance where reference and alternate alleles are not matching, um, and then update RSID values based on the um, RSDB SNP. And then also, if there are any missing neglog P values, we calculate them in this step. Um, from this, we output a VCF file, which is then fed into the next step, um, if necessary, is then to lift over the files. Um, so we're utilizing the Picard software from the Broad Institute, and so essentially what this does is it lifts coordinates from one human reference build to another. Um, so in this instance, we are targeting HG38 to ensure that all the studies in our database are mapped to a common set of uh, human coordinates. And um, one of the challenges with this process is that it requires large reference input files. Um, and so, you know, the naive approach would be to stage those files every single time, um, but that's a very redundant process and can also rack up costs with unnecessary I.O. operations. Um, so one of the solutions we found for this and also an opportunity of cloud computing is the utilization of FSx network drives. Um, so this is a Lustre drive that essentially allows you to perform those same I.O. operations over a network connection, uh, thus eliminating the need to stage these large reference files. 
And the really nice thing about the FSX implementation is that you're able to simply map it to an S3 bucket location, um, and then it automatically is available in that uh, shared drive. And this really alleviates the need to uh, manage duplicate copies of data and really allows for one source of that information. Um, and then some final quality control steps that we've measured, uh, implemented. Uh, so one step is to calculate an estimation of p-values uh, derived from the effect size. And essentially then we compare this with the p-values provided by the source. And so if there are any deviations uh, beyond a set threshold, uh, that study would be flagged for manual review. And then also any uh, errors that may arise from underflow of neglog p-values are also fixed in this step. And then from here, we are then ready to ingest it into the GWAS database. Um, so we take these VCF files and convert it into a Parquet format, um, and then begin the process to integrate it into the uh, Redshift database. Um, so one of the challenges with columnar type databases is that these insert operations can be very expensive. Um, so we employ the use of uh, multiple staging tables and uh, this process still takes a very long time, so it could be on the range from hours to days, depending on how many studies you are ingesting. Um, so usually this is a process that's run over the weekend um, and still is one of, a, one of our pain points, but um, that's, that's the solution we have implemented so far. Um, and just to give some high-level statistics of the database, um, so right now we have over 38,000 studies internalized. Um, referencing 32,000 distinct traits across 15 different populations. And so I put an asterisk by the distinct traits because uh, they're not really distinct. Uh, this is a big curation problem that we have um, in the sense that the phenotype information that we're taking is directly from the annotations provided to the GWAS catalog. Um, so for example, you know, one study could annotate the phenotype as LDL, the other could be like free cholesterol, parentheses LDL, cholesterol LDL, and those would all be mapped to different uh, phenotypes. Um, so this is one challenge that, is, um, that we're still working on, and we are exploring NLP methodologies in addition to manual curation efforts uh, to create a set of standardized ontologies to really aid in uh, finalizing this database. Uh, so to conclude, I've presented how you know, workflow management is essential for reproducible research. I've introduced the Genetics Informatics platform as a framework for the storage and analysis of genetic data on the cloud, and presented uh, and discussed how cloud infrastructure offers many opportunities, but also unique challenges that must be addressed. And then finally, we sh I showed how NextFlow can really drive the ingestion of GWAS data into our distributed database. Um, so just some acknowledgments. This was a collaborative effort between internal and external collaborators. Um, and I'd like to give a special shout out to Ben Alexander, our project lead, and Simeon Karstens, who's been an instrumental developer throughout this project. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, uh, this very great, great talk. Um, what's, what's kind of uh, your sense of the, the next challenges, the next steps for, for this platform? What are you looking at for the future? Yeah, I would say there's two main challenges. One is adoption. Um, you know, we provided these resources for our internal researchers, um, but you know, we still have challenges for them to you know actually know how to use the platform, know how to use the API, the command line, or the UI. And then additionally, as I mentioned um, in the last slide, just that data curation problem. Um, you know, mapping those phenotypes to a common set of ontologies is definitely a challenge. Yeah, that's, that's uh, I think, a challenge for everybody in the field. Um, in, in terms of the, the adoption challenge for your, and, and that's your internal researchers, right? Do you find that it's a, it's a question of documentation or, or like educational resources, things like that? Or uh, is there a gap there that needs to be filled? Yeah, definitely all of the above. Uh, <laughs> documentation is um, something that, you know, I, I'm ashamed to admit, you know, it's something that I definitely need to be better at. Um, but also just education of the resources that are available because as we mentioned, you know, when we're developing this platform, uh, we're very much tunnel vision, you know, we think it's very straightforward and easy to use, 
Um, but you know, to others, it's just an enigma, and it can be challenging yeah. to adopt it uh, for the first time. Yeah, and I think I would say that's a challenge that a lot of us uh, face in this field, and many people in the room, I'm sure, have, have had the, the challenge of needing to educate people on, on various tools and so on. Um, is, is there anything from the Nextflow point of uh, sides that you think that would be helpful um, if, if some of the uh, stumbling blocks that your people are facing are uh, working with Nextflow and, and that sort of thing, um, educational resources that we could be providing, something like that, would that be helpful? Yeah, so I would say, so I was using Nextflow uh, before I joined my current position, mm -hmm. and I've always been a really big supporter of it, um, but when I came to our group, I found that you know not many folks were utilizing that tool to begin with. Um, so I think just increasing engagement and awareness of Nextflow and how straightforward it is to use. I understand there is a little bit of a um, you know steep learning curve, I will say. Um, so maybe alleviating that process mm -hmm. could be helpful for um, widespread adoption. Yeah, I think that's that. That's a very common theme that emerges, and uh, that that is something we'll be working on, kind of uh, bridging those gaps. And we're always really welcome feedback, uh, specific feedback about the kinds of challenges people are facing, especially end users are facing. Um, and we'll we'll try to work with you. We'd be happy to collaborate to to generate some uh, resources to help with that. Um, and that applies to everyone here, by the way. So just feel free to reach out on Slack, and we're happy to help. Um, kind of uh, find solutions to these these problems because I'm sure that a lot of the same thing will apply in a lot of different places. So thank you very much for your talk.